three, two, one. Contact. Happy Tuesday, everyone. It's Jake Geddes. No, I'm sorry. It's Dan Keynes from Atlas Lens Co. Here once again on a beautiful Tuesday. Hope everyone's having a lovely day out there in the world, wherever you are. Uh, special topic for today. Going to talk about red appreciation. Not everybody, you know, first I want to say like here at Atlas Lens Co., we love all cameras. We're kind of camera agnostic. You know, we are camera lovers, no matter if it's shooting on film stills or shooting on a Panasonic SV, SVHS camcorder. We love cameras here. Um, but today I'm going to give a special shout out to Red Digital Cinema because love them or hate them, Red Digital Cinema has a big special place in my heart. They were transformative in my career. Uh, they were inspiring in a lot of ways and we have to hand it to them. I think that they've pushed the industry forward in a lot of technical ways. Um, also want to give a shout out to our team down in Australia and New Zealand right now. We've got Decel, we have Eric Hall, and we have the fantastic Nara Lavoni traveling through Australia and New Zealand. Uh, with a red Raptor VistaVision like we're coming to you from this camera and a red Komodo like we're coming to you from this camera. So just wanted to give you kind of an overview of today's topic which is Red Appreciation Tuesday and also going to show you the new Mercury series lenses, the 36mm and the 42mm on two different size red sensors at the same time. So before we dig into the specifics about the Mercury 36, and 42 and by the way shout out to our crew here we've got Obi uh, producing from behind the scenes we've got Matt helping produce behind the scenes and we have Miette holding it down helping produce behind the scenes today here at Atlas Lens Co headquarters in Glendale California so again the topic today is red appreciation day and we're going to cover format size differences with a 36 millimeter and 42 millimeter mercury um, but I just want to recollect you know, some of the coolest things that have happened in digital cinematography tools that have really pushed the industry forward over the last 15 or 16 years, uh, starting with the Red One Mysterium camera. Anybody out there shoot with a Red One M Mysterium sensor? Um, personally, I've been searching for one to kind of add to the museum collection here. I've got a Red One Mysterium X, which was my first personal uh, Red One system that I purchased and I lusted after that thing for a long time before buying it. Um, but it's, it's hard to imagine, you know, what things were like 15 or 16 years ago in the digital cinematography space. There wasn't a professional level imaging digital cinematography camera that was readily available to people, you know, at different levels of their career, whether you're even at the top tier, um, all the way to the very beginning of your career there weren't super 35 approximate size digital sensors readily available anywhere. Um, and RED really changed that by creating the RED one with the Mysterium sensor, which was the first super 35 CMOS based uh, digital format camera. And it was a pretty affordable camera system at about 17,500 for just the brain or you know the body, what we call the body for most of us. Um, and it recorded on solid, solid state memory, which was like really unheard of in 2007. Uh, and I'll be honest, when I first saw their website, I was like, I don't know if this is real because the website had like a pretty high degree of marketing quality to it. It looked, um, not real. And so I was a little skeptical, uh, because there just wasn't anything like that around, but you know, over time, the cameras started trickling out and getting used on more and more projects. And seeing the image quality that they created uh, was really inspiring. But, you know, I know a lot of people kind of have beef with the reliability of those early cameras because they would say they'd overheat. Um, but I ended up working around the cameras a lot. And typically what I think people thought was overheating was if the V-mount battery would get jiggled loose and then the, cow the camera would just power down. And so that was like a whole new challenging experience. But people thought they were overheating when in fact like the V-mount battery pins were just jiggling loose and uh, you'd lose power and the camera would shut down. And then of course like any good computer 
it takes a little while to restart the computer, right? So, you know, all those early digital camera systems are, and, and the ones we're using today are basically computers with a sensor attached. So there's all kinds of computer related issues that, that pop up. But uh, just gonna run down a long and sort of short list of the red digital sensors that came out over the last 15 years. So we first had that red one, Mysterium. If anybody used or uses that sensor, give us a shout out in the comments. Uh, red one, Mysterium X, which was sort of an evolution of the sensor technology in the red one. Then they came out with the red Epic uh, DSMC digital stills and motion capture DSMC one camera bodies, which also had that red MX sensor. Then they came out with the red dragon sensor, which was a 6K sensor. So you went from a 4K to 4.5K to 6K. And the 6K dragon was like a little bit bigger than traditional Super 35 format. So it was kind of like pushing the boundaries of the format size. And then after the dragon, you have, uh, well, I forgot the Scarlet camera. So the Scarlet was like a low cost version of the DSMC Epic MX sensor. And so that was a way with like lower frame rates to make the camera more accessible uh, for a broader range of people. So big shout out Red for helping bring accessibility into the marketplace again. Um, so Scarlet, Dragon 6K, then they came out with a Scarlet Dragon, which used the Dragon sensor technology, but had reduced frame rates and like reduced recording modes, uh, again, to make it more affordable. Then they came out with the VistaVision Dragon, which was like uh, like a 40.96 by 21.6 millimeter sensor uh, that was kind of like a VistaVision widescreen format. And I never saw one of those in the wild. Like I know very few people actually got the original Dragon VistaVision sensor. So they talked about that and I think they had a hard time fabricating those. Um, so some time went by, very few people got them because I don't think the wafers were easy to make. And in the interim, they came out with the 8K helium sensor, uh, which I did have one of those, and that was like unprecedented high resolution pixel density when that came out. Um, totally different color qualities because your pixels are so much smaller. Uh, after the helium 8K, then they came out with the VistaVision Monstro 8K, which was kind of like an evolution of that dragon 8K, uh, had one of those, loved that sensor, loved that camera, rented a lot, made me a lot of money, used it on a lot of jobs. Um, after that, they came out with the Gemini 5K, which was like reduced pixel density, but larger pixels. And I think they called it Gemini because of uh, dual uh, native ISO, which was a new feature in RED cameras. Uh, with that, and I think they use that a lot in some space program stuff, maybe some like private space program, not NASA, but like private space stuff. Um, and then, you know, big game changer for a lot of us and you know what we're looking at on this camera here, the Komodo 6K. So this is like an even cooler evolution of the, te the technology. It's got a global shutter. Uh, the brain is really small. So it's kind of like a reduced format size. Uh, so easy to mount and rig anywhere. And with that global shutter, you don't have to worry about um, rolling shutter so you can like hard mount this in really aggressive action scenarios, kind of like an action camera and you know you're going to get the shot, you can use strobes. And uh, I know this is a favorite among a lot of you out there because we see you asking about the Komodo and using it with our Orion series or our Mercury series lenses all the time. And I happen to be a big fan of this camera. Um, so shout out Komodo users looking at me right now through a 36 millimeter Mercury. And after the Komodo, then we've got the VistaVision Raptor 8K sensor, which we've got here. Hello, VistaVision Raptor. Uh, kind of an evolution of that Dragon 8K VistaVision to the Monstro 8K VistaVision, and now Raptor 8K VistaVision. Uh, again, an incredibly compact body size, um, feature rich, easy to use, and it's kind of like a Komodo on steroids in some ways. You know, you lose the global shutter functionality, but Having that VistaVision sensor size is really nice. Uh, and then the most up-to-date sensor, well, they came out with two body variants, right? So they've got the Raptor, which we're looking at, and then a Raptor XL, which integrates um, kind of more high-end production level features like built-in ND filters, 
um, all kinds of accessory power and conveniences that make it easier to use on larger scale productions where you're not tacking a bunch of GAC on the camera. Anyway, I'm rambling, but like my point is, I just want to say thanks to Red because they're the rebels. They really push the industry forward. Um, if you go back to two, 2006, 2007, what was the most feature rich prosumer affordable digital cinema camera? Panasonic. And to this day, Panasonic are pretty awesome because they put so many features into the camera. Um, but Red just took it to another level by introducing uh, larger scale CMOS sensors. So you're getting an imager that's about the size of 35 millimeter film. And that was kind of unprecedented in 2007. Um, you know, there were people using CCD sensors with stuff like the Sony F35 or the Panavision Genesis variant of that. And those pushed the industry forward too, but in terms of adoption across people making music videos or commercials, which is where a lot of my work was coming from in 2007, 2008, 2009 and beyond, um, having access to such an incredible camera tool opened the possibilities for me, my career, and a lot of my colleagues and associates um, and friends. And so I'm grateful for that because it challenged other camera manufacturers to also push forward in creating new, more viable cameras for production that's accessible. Um, it really changed the independent filmmaking market. It changed career paths for me. And so I just want to express my gratitude, Red Appreciation Day. Um, and again, I'm pretty camera agnostic. I love using all cameras. So big shout out to all the other camera manufacturers, but today is a special day. Um, and finally, you know, the last one I meant to mention is the uh, Red Rhino, which is uh, kind of, I think, I could be wrong, like a helium update. So the helium is like the S35 8K high density sensor, and the Rhino is also an 8K a high pixel density sensor that's great for you know action or wildlife where you're going to be farther away from uh, the subject probably or possibly and you just need high high resolution with high pixel density um, so to kind of get into the key topic which is atlas lenses here uh, what we're showing right now is a mercury 36 millimeter on the Komodo and we've got a mercury 42 millimeter on the Raptor, and we've got those configured top, Komodo on top, Raptor on the bottom. No, I have that switch. Thank you, Matt, for correcting me. I will make mistakes. I am human, despite what you all have heard. I'm not a replicant. Um, yes, so to correct myself, the Raptor's on the top side, and the Komodo's on the bottom side. Uh, so a lot of you had questions about these formats and the different focal lengths with the different sensors. So we wanted to actually put this up for you to see um, directly. And I can give you a quick little flare. And while I'm flaring you, uh, Obi and Matt can kind of help pull up some of the questions. And we're also joined by Oxlana. Um, and as part of Red Appreciation Day, Oxana has brought a special treat for us, which is, uh, you know, we all like to pretend that cameras are our tools. And it's true, they are tools, uh, but they're also our toys, right? So um, the best toy is also a tool, maybe, because it lets you get things done, uh, but it also feels fun to use. Um, but we have a really great toy here from Rivar Cine, which is a micro cine, mini cine, uh, 8K Vista Vision Raptor camera with an Atlas, Orion 65 millimeter model lens. So if you have papers on your desk that are getting blown away or you just wanna make people laugh uh, and you're a steady cam operator or you've got a Ronin on set and you're like in between setups and you just wanna like freak people out, you can get out this really cute toy, uh, high-end toy, I should say. It's a very high-end, nice heft to it model. And we actually resell these in the Atlas uh, web store and uh, occasionally we raffle these off because I think they're just too fun, too cool. And I'd say this is a really great part of Red Appreciation Day. So shout out Rivar Cine, shout out Red, shout out Jared, uh, shout out Andres, shout out Clark, shout out all the crew of Red. Really appreciate you all. 
Um, keep doing what you're doing. Keep challenging the industry. Sometimes you ruffle people's feathers the wrong way, but that's all part of changing the world, right? And um, nobody's perfect. Love you. Um, I'm not perfect either, so beef with me after this. Um, but yeah, so we've got the the 42 millimeter and the 36 millimeter Mercury's on the V Raptor and the Komodo. And I'd love to take your questions. And after a few minutes, I can swap these so you could see the field of view difference between the two lenses. And a uh, big shout out to Visual Harassment. I've got my Misfits monkey hat on today. Um, shout out Eric and Ari Robbins and Visual Harassment. Thanks for the hat. I love it. And, uh, you know, it kind of embraces that rebel spirit. You know, we're. We're a serious company, but we also like to have fun. So what can I answer for everybody about our uh, fantastic Mercury series lenses on these two camera formats? Do you guys have any questions for me? Why now the increase in the case of ultra? So we have a question about a price increase. Uh, fantastic question. Why a price increase? Everything in the world is getting more expensive. We tried as long as we could not to raise the prices on the Mercury series lenses by offering the pre-order discount. So if, and you actually still have time to get in your pre-order deposit. So if you want to take advantage of early adopter pricing on Mercury series 36 millimeter, 42 and 72 millimeter lenses, if you haven't already done so now is a really good time to get your deposit in because this is the best price you're probably ever going to see on a Mercury series lens secure your pre-order. If you're not ready to take the pre-order when your ticket is called, it's okay. Just let us know you need more time. Um, but I would say consider it an investment in your career. Consider it an investment in yourself. Uh, I do not give financial advice, but if you're looking to get these lenses at the best price, now is a great time to do it. And the world is only going to get more expensive, I'm sorry to say. Um, but we want to keep the company running and keep everybody satisfied by hiring more fantastic people here at Atlas, uh, putting more money into research and development to create new lenses that hopefully satisfy and um, excite all of your cinematography needs worldwide. But now's a great time if you want to get your deposit in for a Mercury series and take advantage of the early pre-order pricing. And I'm sorry to raise the prices, but I have to do it. Uh, we have to do it. And in the long run, it's going to be painful for a short time, but we think it will serve you better in terms of keeping Atlas around and making the world's greatest anamorphic cinematography lenses for all of you. Are the cameras the same distance away? Yes, so the cameras are currently three and a half feet away from me to the nodal point of the sensor. Uh, and they're, yeah, basically the same distance away, three and a half feet, plus minus a few millimeters. It's hard, you know, we don't have like a beam splitter rig to get those precise, but it's close enough. Well, Matt's nodding at me to let me know that he agrees. Yeah. Will Atlas be in India? Will Atlas be in India? We were just in India for Broadcast India maybe about three months ago. I might have that wrong. A little more than three months ago. Time flies, doesn't it? Um, but shout out to everyone in India. We, we love seeing the content that everyone in India is shooting. Uh, we love you, Cinescope India. We love you, Tinu International. Uh, we love you, Patsa. We love everybody out in India. So keep making fantastic films. Keep using your Atlas lenses, and we'll hope to see you again soon. And if you have the chance, uh, take a little vacation and come visit us in Las Vegas. Enjoy. There's some great Indian food in Vegas um, that covers, like, all of India. They don't just uh, separate by region. They've got, like, Himalayan food even. It's called Mint Indian Bistro. If you're in Vegas and you like Indian food of any variety, check out Mint. That place is chef's kiss. One more, One more question coming in. Any plans for being Austin, Texas to drop a Mercury before release? Ooh. Well, technically they're pre-release now for pre-order, and we did have a set down uh, with David Wells, who's a fantastic cinematographer based out of Texas. Uh, are there any events in Texas? We didn't make it to South by Southwest this year. I'm sorry. Maybe next year. Got a lot going on over here, trying to get production going with the Mercuries and prepping 
more exciting surprises for you all in terms of new Atlas products. Um, but it's not that far, and I've heard a lot of people from California move to Austin, so if you're missing California, come on back to Glendale. We'll give you a tour. Love to show you around. Even if you're not from California, come over. We welcome you, and we do these demos weekly. I know it's not the same as being in person, but if you know of any killer events or killer rental houses in Austin, shoot us an email at info at atlaslensco.com. Let us know what rental houses we should be connecting with or what kind of um, local events or organizations in Austin are the ones that are popping, and we will try to get involved as best we can. Do you have the Atlas Orion in stock or is there a wait? Currently we have all eight Atlas Orion series lenses basically in stock. Um, so 32, 40, 50, 65, 80, and 100 are relatively available and ready in stock in both metric and imperial scales, PL or EF mount. We do have a few silver edition uh, series lenses still available. So if you haven't gotten silver edition and you want silver edition, uh, we still do have those. And if you've never experienced those, maybe we can show you on here on the stream next week. And if you're in Glendale, come by tomorrow to our Glendale headquarters. We'll show them to you in person. And the ones I'm forgetting, 25 millimeters. So we do actually have a few 25 millimeter Orions on shelf and ready to ship. And the 21s are starting to ship very slowly now. So if you have a 21 millimeter Orion pre-order in, expect to be getting uh, contact from our sales team very soon about your order allocation. And if you don't have a 21 millimeter and you want one, now is a great time to get in touch and get your pre-order locked in and you should see your lens within 60 days probably. Hopefully that answers your question. The Orion series, they're available. The extenders and expanders that make the Orion series, all of them cover full frame imagers edge to edge are in. Um, a lot of people ask about V-Raptor or Monstro 8K. The lenses will generally cover 8K 6.5 with a tiny bit of vignetting. Um, most of them actually cover without any vignetting, but the wides do have a tiny bit of vignetting, so you need like a 5% punch in, which would give you like a 7.8 or 7.5K uh, resolution master in 8K 6.5 for a CinemaScope delivery. And I see some hands pointing at me with some more questions, so What's shout out. What's the closest out. you can get with a 42, and then what diopters do you recommend? So both the 36 and 42 have incredible close focus, and because Matt is so helpful and amazing, I'm actually going to have him throw both lenses to short focus, and then uh, I will move my hand into position. I can't jump over the desk, I could. Oh yeah, we got this. So um, guide me in, Matt, and I'll bring uh, this little cute little V-Raptor model um, in. So that's minimum focus on 42, 42 millimeter on the V-Raptor 8K Vista Vision. And then over here we have 36 millimeter. So I'm actually gonna be able to come closer because this comes down to 18 inches. This guy comes down to about 24 inches. Yeah. Yeah, so, so come on. everyone get a mental picture of that V-Raptor on the 42 millimeter. And then Matt's gonna guide me in uh, slowly. Am I? I might be too far in now, no? Maybe a little too. Yeah, right about there. Right there. So I'm about 18 inches there with the uh, the camera. And that's looking through the 36 millimeter. So hopefully that gives you a very direct, um, and I'll kind of angle this to try to, let me know how bad that is. I don't know. No, it looks good. Okay, I think they're both matching-ish. But oh, okay. that guy's, hmm, let's see. Yeah. Hopefully that helps. Um, and in a minute, I can actually flip flop the lenses so you could see the effect of using the wider lens on the V Raptor. Um, common misconception the V Raptor in 6K is not exactly the same size as the Komodo in 6K. So the V Raptor is still a little bit larger because the pixel density is less. Um, and I have a very handy tool if you want to look at the direct comparison of the format. So you actually get a little bit bigger sensor size with the V-Raptor in 6K Super 35 compared to the Komodo in 6K Super 35. Pop on phfx.com. Big shout out, Phil Holland. Uh, I know Phil is 
an even bigger red person than me. He's like massive red fan guy and also just super helpful genius cinematographer guy and coder and multi-talented individual. So he's got this fantastic tool on phfx.com called Format Compare and that will let you put up basically just about any digital or film format that you can think of and compare it to another one. So side-by-side -side comparison of the recording format size. Um, and he also has a, another fantastic tool called Shot Prep that will give you very detailed information about what you can expect in terms of angle of view, field of view with different anamorphic lenses like our Orion series and Mercury series. No matter what camera you're using, whether it's a Bull X with 16 millimeter film, uh, an Alexa 35, Alexa Classic, all the way up to a red Vista Vision 8K or a Sony Venice. So phfx.com format compare, phfx.com shot prep, two super tools you need to check out. Um, we have to build a sub page on our website linking to them because we love it so much we decided to sponsor those apps and sponsor what Phil's doing with those free to use tools. Thank you, Phil. Love the tools, super helpful stuff. And I think Obi's letting me know there's two more questions. So I'm gonna try to answer those as quickly as I can. And then if there's no more questions, I'm going to flip-flop these, and then I'll probably sign off for the day. So uh, fire away, Obi. Do all the Mercury's from the Shano 125 D series from Phil Selfie series fit in? Yes. So fantastic question. To repeat it, Obi's saying uh, someone out there is asking if the Mercury lenses have a consistent 1.5 anamorphic aspect compression ratio, uh, what I like to call an anamorphic coefficient of 1.5 through the focus range. Absolutely all of the Mercury lenses have a consistent anamorphic coefficient of 1.5 times. So if you're at close focus, it's gonna be at 1.5. If you're at infinity, it's gonna be 1.5. And you don't have to worry about people's faces getting warpy, wonky, or weird, um, unless you're using barrel distortion, which is part of the lens design to your advantage to make your picture even cooler. Uh, but yeah, you don't have mumps in the traditional sense. And one more question. The new Mercury focal length that's not available for pre-order yet, Will they also be increased by price upon pre-order, or will, they, will you have an opportunity to potentially get them cheaper? So, fantastic question. Um, to reflect what Obi just asked from the people out in the world, people are wondering what is the pricing for the 54 millimeter, 95 millimeter, and 138 millimeter Mercury lenses. We haven't set the pricing for those. We're trying to figure out how much it costs to make them. We're currently in the process of prototyping, and if you come see it at an NAB. 2023 in Vegas, or if you see us on a live stream, we're going to be debuting the Mercury 54 millimeter for sure. I was fortunate enough to get to hold a prototype that we built uh, just this week and see first light through it, and it's an incredible addition to the Mercury family. We haven't set prices for those, but typically what we like to do is reward early adopters because we know that there's a wait time associated uh, with getting the lenses. And that's part of our production planning process. It's a way that we like to approach building up the lenses. It's worked for us really well since we started with the Orion series back in 2017. And so we're going to continue that tradition. We haven't set firm pricing on those products yet, but uh, check them out. We think you're going to like them. And we're always going to be doing our best to advocate for cinematographers, directors, rental houses, everyone out there who wants to use, own, or rent. Orion series and Mercury series Atlas lenses. Um, all the Atlas lenses are made for cinematographers by cinematographers. And so we're really trying to reflect and support our community as best as we possibly can and keep pricing fair. And then once to see the three of them throughout the full stretch. Sure. So uh, Matt is going to first focus rack the V Raptor uh, that's got the 42 millimeter on it. And he's going to go from near to far or far to near, I'm not sure. I can't see from where I am. Um, but if there's something specific, maybe I can show you a little bokeh light here. I don't know if I'm gonna break this flashlight, let's see. Yeah, I don't think this is the right one, but I'll dig one up so I can create a near field bokeh. Yeah. Um, in the words of Elton John, I'm just a candle in the wind. I'm really excited because I'm going to the Depeche Mode concert tonight. Anybody else out there going to see Depeche Mode? Uh, down at the, I call it the Great Western Forum, but I think it's called the Kia Forum now. 
Uh, anybody like Depeche Mode out there? It's okay if you don't, I do. Go ahead and you guys can direct me, everybody out in the world, you tell me what you want to see and I'll do my best to show it. And if you don't have any notes, we'll flip flop these two lenses in a moment. And if you're just joining the stream now, we had a little historical overview that was not that great done by me about the red digital sensors that came out over the last 15 years and shout out to Red for changing the industry and making cinematography more fun. Um, but yeah, I think, uh, think we're gonna wrap it up. We're gonna flip flop the lenses and then uh, see if there's any other questions and then we'll say goodbye for the day. So think of your questions while we're switching. Uh, you can still hear my voice, but you can't see me too well until these gentlemen uh, get the lenses lined up. Yeah, out of the way. Yeah, 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 there you go, got it. Nice. So we just flip flopped the lenses and now we have the 36 millimeter on the V-Raptor. Is that in focus? And we've got the 42 millimeter on the Komodo. So the V-Raptor is in 8K mode, the Komodo is in 6K mode, and uh, you can see there's a fairly more significant size difference because not only do you have a bigger sensor uh, with a wider lens, and you have the longer lens on the smaller sensor, so your field of view difference is going to be more severe this time. Um, and I'll hit you guys with a flare. You know, in my former life, I would be doing like really good color matching between different cameras. And because I'm a dad and also running a company, I didn't have time to like really color match these cameras very well and neither did the team. Um, but we did our best in a very short amount of time to get this live stream going for you. So. Maybe one of these days we'll get in a DIT, maybe someone really epic. I mean, he's a DP now, but um, Brooke Willard, fantastic guy who started as a DIT and, you know, imaging specialist and is now shooting uh, major TV shows and movies. Um, and just a really nice guy. So maybe we'll get in some guests uh, to help talk about color correction and adjusting color on different cameras. I think that'd be a fun topic. And if you all out there have suggestions for guests to get in so I'm not just blathering, by all means, shoot us an, an email to info at atlaslensco.com. Love to get your suggested guests, or if some of you want to be guests, come in, ask me questions live, or you know, chat with me and I'll ask you questions, and we'll make this like a micro podcast or something. Um, any questions about what we're seeing out of the V-Raptor with the 42 millimeter Mercury and, uh, no, sorry, flip-flopped it. V-Raptor with the 36 millimeter Mercury and the Komodo with the 42 millimeter Mercury. And shout out to the Red Komodo users group. Um, this is where I got the idea to do this because you were thoughtfully asking questions about if you could only take one to a desert island, which one would you get? And I think my point was really it depends on your shooting style. So, you know, of course, the most ambivalent, ambiguous answer in the world. Um, but some people love a wide angle and some people love a medium. And in a way, the best thing about an anamorphic lens is that you're getting two different lenses in one. Um, so it really depends on your shooting style and how wide you like to go. But the 36 is definitely way wider than you might think for a 36 millimeter lens because your horizontal angle of view is like a 24. And for a 42, your horizontal angle of view is like a 28. And then you just think about how those spherical equivalents would work on the different sensor formats and you have a pretty good idea. Um, but it's really kind of spectacular to see it live in person. Um, so even though we're streaming these, if you have time, come down to Glendale or come see us in Vegas at NAB in a couple weeks. And if you haven't uh, booked your tickets for NAB yet, I think there's still open registration for free exhibit passes on our website. Go to www.atlaslensco.com or email us at info at atlaslensco.com will help you get uh, free show floor tickets to walk the NAB experience and 
you know, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas, so I won't tell anyone. Uh, any questions or other comments before we sign off for the day? And, you know, hopefully you were able to endure my rambling. No, I think we're good. Okay. Thank you. Have a wonderful Tuesday. Have a lovely rest of the week. Have a lovely day and wishing you all the best. Uh, shout out everyone out there. Stay safe. Have fun. We'll see you either tomorrow or we'll see you next week. Bye-bye.